the revelation of God's will and his desires for us as the subjects in his kingdom. But ultimately, understand this, church. The Bible is not a rule book or a guidebook to fix our problems. It is communication from God revealing who we are and who he is. In fact, the majority of the New Testament is written in letter format. From Paul to churches, Peter to churches, James to churches, yes, but from God to us. If we approach the word of God with the intent to just have some wise words fix us up, we're having the wrong approach. That's not it. Know God through his word. He will then work in our lives to transform us to be like Christ. A high view of scripture does not allow us to have a cookbook view of the Bible, a self-help book, a rule book or a guidebook, a life's map book, a compilation of wisdom or a magic talisman, as I said before. The binding, the pages, the leather, if it's leather, has no redeeming value greater than that of any other book. But the content of who God is revealed to us, divinely inspired to us, in this word of truth, the revelation of our creator and redeemer and his word in teaching us how to know and respond to him in a real, genuine relationship is the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said it's the power of God into salvation. All of scripture is this way. Scripture is God-centered. It's about God. You say, well, duh, Pastor Matt. Of course it's about God. However, there's a lot of Christianity today, and sometimes in my own heart, where it becomes all about me and what I need and what I get. The Bible is theocentric. It's about God. It reveals to us God, and we learn who God is, and we respond to our divine God through the pages of Scripture. And friends, the parables... Reveal God to us. Parables are theocentric. They are about God. That's one of the first principles we need to understand when we're looking at it. Number two, we must approach Scripture as normal literature. First, we must approach Scripture with a high view. It is God's word. But then also, we must approach it as normal literature. Second Peter chapter 2 gives us an indication as to the understanding of this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture, the Scriptures itself, is of any private interpretation. What that means is of any private interpretation. It means men did not come up with these truths on their own. The things you read here was not Peter's ideas. The things you read was not a private interpretation of Isaiah. It's not what he thought God wanted man to see or wanted man to hear. Jeremiah did not give us what he thought God wanted us to have. Jeremiah gave us what God gave Jeremiah to give us. That's what that means, that it's not of any private interpretation. Sometimes that verse is used out of context referring to we don't need to interpret it. No, it's referring to when it was given in the originals, in the original time through those original authors, it came from God. However, he contrasts that by saying, for the prophecy, the scripture, came not in old time by the will of man. Man did not write the Bible, although man penned it and scraped, scraped it and scratched it and every other thing they did to communicate it. But holy men of God, separated men, men who were chosen for the task, spake as they were moved or directed or led along by the Holy Ghost. So we have here one of the miraculous aspects of the word of God is that this is the divine inspiration of God. This is the breath of God to us. <clears throat> and yet at the same time, God chose to use normal men to do it. The transmission of scripture is something that is somewhat enigmatic. How did God exactly do that? Uh, I reject the idea that God used some kind of uh, trance or vision where the men didn't know what they were doing. And God took over their body and they just started writing something. That's, that does not fall in line with how you view all of Scripture. And neither is the idea that God, God gave them principles or ideas and they just kind of figured out and filled in the blanks from there. But rather, a miraculous work of God, this is called the inspiration of God, by the way, and it was inspired in the originals when they wrote, 
by the miraculous work of God, God took normal guys. Kings, yes. Priests, yes. Prophets, yes. But also fishermen. Tax collectors. Tag-alongs like Mark. Just tagged along everywhere. He took normal people, separated for his work, and through them, using their knowledge, their backgrounds, their experience, their education, their understanding, he gave us the very words of God. That's a miracle in and of itself. And yet that's what God did. And so we must understand then Scripture, yes, as the direct communique of God, but understanding it is God communicating through normal people writing in normal literature. Bible scholars call this the normal interpretation. I mean, we interpret it normally. It's still, it's God's word, but it's literature. It's written in a book, right? It's written in books, in letters, in commands. It's written that way. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about when I refer to this. This means that we need to give it all the authority it demands as God's word and yet interpret it as we would other literature in this sense. Interpreting it, interpreting the word of God in the context of when it was written, who was the original audience, what were the factors around the place and timing of writing. This has been described by Orthodox Bible students as interpreting Scripture in its historical and cultural context. I mean, you don't like it when people take your words and twist them to be what you want, what they want them to say, right? Like the news media. I don't think God's too pleased when we do that with His word either. We have to understand it in context of how it was written. Therefore, that means it's a little more work, right? We can't just grab a little verse here or there. We've got to go around the entire context of it, look before and after it, do a study on the bigger picture of that entire book. Yeah, starting to get a little bit diligent here. Well, that's why he says, do your diligence, study. <laughs> Let me give you an illustration of this. Historical normal context of the original audience helps us better understand and interpret what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, when he washed their feet, to do what he did. He told them to do the same thing. Now, if we were just to rip that right out there, not understand the context, we might think that then there's a ritual that we must partake of, and that's washing each other's feet. However, if we interpret it within the cultural and historical and the scriptural context, the grammatical context, we would realize that when every other Jewish leader of his household was wearing the finery, preparing for the highest and holiest of days, the Passover, in the religious calendar, Jesus shocks everyone by taking off his formal clothes and putting on the garb of a servant. Then washing one by one the feet of the, the, feet of the disciples caked with mud and dust from their exposure to the dirty elements. This was not a ritual he desired then to perform, but rather an example that the height of piety and holiness and worship is really a demonstration of humble service. We could just rip that right out and start a religion based upon washing feet. However, it's much more powerful when we realize the entire context of what was going on and what Jesus is saying there. Context is important. So we must approach Scripture with a high view, we must approach Scripture as a normal view, it's normal literature, and we must approach Scripture literally. We must approach Scripture literally. Basically, this means we take the plain sense of Scripture as the plain sense of Scripture. One has said this, I think it's a little overused phrase, but I'll use it. If the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. Scripture is divinely inspired literature, and literature, whether books of history, books of prophecy, letters, or other aspects of Bible books, they are expected to be taken literally. What do I mean by that? When you say something, you expect it to be taken literally, right? If it's a literal thing, historical thing. One danger that sometimes happens with Christians in our Bible study is seeking to find the so-called deep meanings of God. Or as some has said about parables, making a parable walk on all fours. Making every little thing spiritual. A negative, I got a negative example. I couldn't get away from this. This one, this one killed me. Okay. A pastor preached a message. I found it um, written down, in written form. pastor preached a message on why a church should have a bus ministry. And his reason why a church should have a bus ministry is because he said it's fast.